Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Harry, and this is Cybersecurity for Everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the origins of the internet and specifically the inspiration for a world changing idea. And so, the fundamental question that we want to talk about over the next couple of videos is how did we get here? So, when you think about the world in which we live today, we have billions of connected devices. We have laptops, we have phones, we have tablets, we stream a lot of our video now. And our ability to communicate with our loved ones over video chat is just taken for granted. But how do we actually get there? And so, when you think about the billions of connected devices and the trillions of messages sent from individuals and devices all over the world, it's really the, a question of how did that process evolve? How did we actually develop the infrastructure and capability to produce such amazing applications? Video, audio, text enabling faster communications allow for more tightly knit communications all over the world. So, how did we get here? So, there's some key concepts that I want to drive home to, to emphasize why this is uh, such an important development in human history. So, the first concept that we need to think about is that the development of the internet was an evolutionary process. It didn't just happen overnight. Someone didn't just wake up and say, hey, I got a great idea. They put it on paper and the very next year we have the internet. It evolved. And that evolutionary process was the function of multiple individuals, hundreds of individuals and different stakeholders that worked together over many, many decades in order to develop what we know today as the internet. So, academic inspiration was a part of this process. Someone had to conceive of this idea of the internet. So, oftentimes we find that uh, uh, professors and researchers, instructors uh, 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 alike are involved in coming up with new ideas, new concepts. So, academia certainly played a role. But they weren't alone. The government also played a key role in the development of the technologies related to the internet. So, we're going to talk about that in a different video. And finally, the private sector is involved. The private sector and its incredible ability to innovate was an essential player in the development of the internet. So, an evolutionary process, multiple individuals and stakeholders involved, but also the interplay between academia, government, and the private sector were all fundamentally important to the development of the internet. So, let's talk about some basic questions that actually need to be answered when we think about some of the origins of this central idea. First of all, how do you create and expand a technology in terms of scale, performance, and higher order functionality to actually develop something like the internet? So, how do you actually do that? It's, it's one thing to just invent it in your garage and maybe build a prototype. But how do you scale that so it becomes geographically dispersed and used by billions of people around the world? This is actually a really, really hard thing to do. Second, how do you communicate and share ideas about the internet before the internet is actually built? In today's world, we come up with a great idea and maybe you post it online on your blog or, or uh, you, know, you, you get uh, uh, some, some piece of information that is broadcast uh, by, by a media company that's streamed online. But if you're talking 40, 50, 60 years ago, before the internet actually existed, and your chief means of communicating ideas are through periodicals or through journal articles, it's actually much, much more difficult. Things move a lot slower. Third, how do groups of people, different groups of people, geographically distributed, communicate with one another? How do they work together to develop this type of technology? And remember, we're talking about people who live in or who work in academia, who work in the private sector, as well as the government. So, how do they actually work and communicate together when they're scattered all over the earth? So, these are really practical questions we have to address. And finally, 
How do you convert theory, what is a good idea, into what becomes the underlying fabric of our society? Because when you look at things like power and water systems and other smart city infrastructure, our ability to monitor these modern systems is all laid on top of this, this key networking technology that we're now discussing the origins of. So the questions that have to be answered are pretty fundamental. And how we get there isn't always clear. So it's important oftentimes to look at the history, the origins, and the development of this evolutionary process. So let's start at the beginning, a vision of the future. There are thousands of individuals that were involved in the development of the internet. But I just want to talk about a couple of key concepts early on. So the first is a vision of an interconnected world, a series of interconnected devices that can transmit large volumes of data. The second is a new theory of breaking up data into what we call packets. And the idea is that these packets then can be moved around from one computer to the next. And finally, the third idea is a prototype network that is developed uh, to connect two particular devices, one in California and one in Massachusetts. So combining this broader vision of a worldwide global network with packetized data in a digital format, finally, actually showing a, a lab prototype of a connection between two devices geographically dis, uh, distributed, are three core concepts that emerge from the late 1950s and in the early 1960s. And so folks at MIT and other academic institutions around the world are involved in the development of some of these key ideas. So we bring these three concepts in the 1950s and 60s where we have a vision of an integrated set of modern digital networks that are working together utilizing packetized traffic and geographically dispersed. But why is this not the end of the story? Why is it that we don't just talk about these brilliant academics who actually put together, had this world-changing idea, and that's the end of the story? Well, the reason is, is that it oftentimes can be difficult to bring good ideas into the real world and at scale. And so once you have a future that's envisioned, you probably need to start off with building a small model. You don't initially go from, hey, I've got a great idea, to multi-billion dollar networks being developed worldwide. You've got to start off in, in a much more measured way. So we want to start off with building a small model. And building that model, certainly if you're in academia, requires money. Uh, you know, most academics are not independently wealthy. They're not willing to write that million dollar check or two million dollar check to self-fund uh, development of a good idea. So we need access to money to build out a small model. And so the question becomes, where is the best place to find that? So there are maybe a couple of options. You might seek to go to the government. You might seek to go to the private sector. Both of them have different incentive structures. If there isn't a profit to be made, maybe the private sector isn't interested in taking that risk. Said another way, if you go and talk to a CEO of a large Fortune 500 company and say, you know, hey, Mr. CEO or Mrs. CEO, I want you to write me a check for $3 billion so I can build out a global network, and they have no concept of how they would actually monetize that development, you know, after they stop laughing at you, uh, you know, they would politely ask you to leave. So if there is no private sector incentive, you may want to go to the government to see if they can fund a particular study. So in this video, we've talked about the fundamental questions that have to be answered in order to achieve this early vision of a globally dispersed network that had, deals with packetized data and we started to bring up a fundamental question of once you have a good idea, how do you actually start to move that forward into something that's more practical, specifically a small model? In our next video, we're going to talk about how we move from a good idea to a small model 
and the role that government played in the development of the internet. I hope to see you next time. Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Harry, and this is Cybersecurity for Everyone. In today's video, I want to talk about how we move away from the origins of the internet, the theoretical origins of the internet, into something that is akin to a small prototype, specifically how the government supported that effort. The challenge that we're confronted with is that in the early 1960s, you had a series of researchers all over the world that it conceived of a world of interconnected devices. These are really just solid ideas, good ideas. And the question is, is that foundational technologies had not been invented yet. So you have this vision of a different world, but new technologies need to be developed. And the challenge is, how do you convert good ideas into a model that allows you to test them? And more specifically, where do you find the resources to do so? So by the mid-1960s, research had continued at academic institutions on this notion of an interconnected world using packetized data. And by 1966, Lawrence Roberts moves over to DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And this is a, think of it as a think tank for the federal government. And when Lawrence Roberts moves over into this space, he decides that uh, through a white paper that's submitted, he decides that he is going to fund in 1968 a project that becomes known as ARPANET. And ARPANET has, in essence, just a handful of nodes to demonstrate at a prototype level uh, a series of interconnected networks. And those nodes are at the universities of uh, uh, UCLA, Stanford, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. These nodes, and here's a map of uh, the early network topology of ARPANET in 1969, and you can see that it's limited. But the goal of the DARPA project is not to go from good idea to worldwide communications network. It's to demonstrate that there is a, a, a real ability to move packetized traffic or data from one part of the earth to the next. In this particular case, mostly focused around the western coast of the United States. So this internetwork concept, we later shorten it to internet, but this internetwork concept is based on the idea that computers can talk to one another by interlinking multiple independent networks together. So you can create a separate network at UCLA, a separate network at Stanford, University of Utah, UC Santa Barbara, but they can talk to one another. So ARPANET, which was funded in 1968 by DARPA, by the federal government, the US federal government, is the first packet switching network in human history. And there are some very specific protocols or instructions that are developed at this time two of which are internet protocol, which really deals with the location of computers. It's kind of like your address, uh, similar to your home address. Uh, but this is an address where the computer resides. And the other is transmission control protocol, which are really is about the instructions of how to transfer data between two devices. It's a set of instructions that everyone can agree to. Now, it's important because both of those protocols, developed in the late 1960s, are still in existence today. In fact, are fundamental to the way that the internet works. This is important. So there are some general rules of this internetwork. The first rule is that each distinct network has to stand on its own. They're independent. The second is that communication is made on what we call a best effort basis. So if for whatever reason, because we've taken a bunch of data and we've chopped it up into small pieces that we call packets, if one of those packets, when it's being transmitted, does not make it, it gets retransmitted. So that's the second rule. The third is that there's something, you know, we don't have a name for it at this point, but that we would call a black box. So something that allows us to interconnect these various networks. 
These black boxes later become what we know as routers. We'll talk more about that in other videos. And then fourth, and this is really important, there is no global control. This inter-network concept does not require that a single organization or government owns the entire network. There is no global control. And this is a groundbreaking idea. We have this vision of a limited set of networks that are working together. And it's important to note, when we think back to the 1960s, the late 1960s, we didn't have a world of smart devices. We didn't have a world in which we streamed our entertainment. It was a very, very different world, something that uh, you know, most folks uh, today probably wouldn't recognize, would have a hard time if they went back in time 50, 60 years ago. They would want to reach for their smartphone, uh, whether it was to connect on the road with their family or friends or to be able to watch entertainment uh, you know, on demand. That world did not exist. And so back in the 1960s, the researchers and the folks at DARPA had never really considered that the number of networks would be greater than just a handful. The idea was that a small number of networks would be required, primarily for research purposes, and that ARPANET could serve a very useful function by facilitating interactions between research groups. In fact, in the early days of the ARPANET, it was conceived that no more than 256 networks would be required worldwide. Think of that, only 256. As the ARPANET gets built, we will obviously want to be able to use this network for some purpose. And so we need a couple of good applications that are useful to, you know, for people to actually use this network. And so at the time, only a few applications are available. Things like file transfer protocol, or what we call FTP, is really an ability for us to simply transfer files from one point of the earth to the next. And you think about it, back in the 1960s, if you wanted to move information, let's say it's a report that you've written, and you want to send it from California to let's say uh, Boston, how did you do it? Well, guess what? You probably stored that information maybe on a magnetic tape, you put it in a package and you mailed it. Or you gave it to someone, they jumped on an airplane and they flew. That's how you moved information. So file transfer protocol, this ability to use interconnected networks to move data is groundbreaking at the time. We also may want to allow people to remotely log into other computers. If I'm in Utah and I want to use a computer in, at Stanford University, if I don't have the ability to remotely log in and use this new inter-network, then what am I doing? I'm either driving there or I'm flying there from Utah to Stanford to use that computer. So Telnet, the ability to remotely log in, is really important. And finally, this concept of electronic mail, email, that we all know and love. Maybe uh, uh, some of us don't like email that much. I know I get several hundred email a day, and sometimes it's a little, little hard to, to manage it. But email is also developed in this same time period. Once we've developed a small prototype, a small model of this revolutionary set of ideas, now we have a new challenge. How do we scale it? Government provided the funding to build that small network, to build ARPANET at what we would call a bench scale. But the question is, how do we expand this concept of inter-networking and allow it to evolve with other technologies that we start to see emerge in the 1970s and into the early 1980s? Can we leverage this emerging set of data and technologies to increase business productivity? And this becomes a fundamental set of questions in the 1970s and into the early 1980s. In this video, we've talked about how we were able to move from a good idea into a small model prototype that was functional. In our next video, we're gonna talk about how the private sector and private sector ingenuity and communities of interest helped develop this inter-networking concept even further to set us up 
for a large scale explosion of internet technologies in the 1980s and the 1990s. See you next time. Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Harry, and this is Cybersecurity for Everyone. In this video, I want to talk about how we move away from a small government sponsored program into something that's more widely accepted. By the late 1960s, ARPANET demonstrated that a distributed and digitized network was feasible. And remember, ARPANET was this ability to move packetized data from one part of the earth to the next. And that had been developed as a general idea in the early part of the 1960s and late 1950s. This academic vision had been supported by government sponsorship by DARPA to prove out that there was in fact a way to enable this radical new way of communicating. And the original vision by the late 1960s was that only 256 addresses would be needed on this internetwork. Because remember, at this time, computers were the size of an entire room. So people had a really, really hard time envisioning that all of us one day would have access to computing power that could fit in the palm of our hand. So how did that change? Well, how did this concept of internetworking become more popular? And that's the story that I want to explore today. So the story of the late 1960s through the 1970s is about the expanding popularity of networks and new developments in computing technology. With the success of ARPANET and the progression of all these new protocols and instructions and applications, there are new networks that are being developed, but they tend to be ad hoc, meaning that they're, they're built with their own set of instructions and their own set of technologies in some cases. By the early 1970s though, a new standardized method for networking has been invented. This approach called Ethernet had been developed at the Xerox Corporation. Ethernet is one of these foundational technologies that we still use today. But a standardized way of networking allows a whole range of incentives by private sector corporations to develop new technologies and to adopt those technologies as they become cheaper to implement. So by the 1970s, the story becomes one where we're combining new technologies. We have a new standardized way of networking. We have the ability to move more computer terminals to be used by private corporations. More companies in the Fortune 500 are using computer terminals to do their business. They're moving away purely from pen and paper. And by the latter part of the 1970s into the early 1980s, the development of new standard personal computers, things like the Apple I and the Apple II, are developed. And new corporations like Apple Computing and Microsoft are built on this idea, this new vision, that computing technology will actually come to the masses. So the explosion of networks and computers create the need for new technologies and new instructions to be conceived and developed. One good example, because there are hundreds that I could cite, but I just want to talk about a few. One good example is the ability to have these addresses, these computer addresses. We talked about internet protocol before, and we'll talk about it in more depth in another video. But the idea that we have these very, very arcane addresses, things like 8.8.8.8, .8 and being able to convert that into something that's more human friendly, like Google. So we need a set of instructions that allow us to do this translation. And so we developed something called the domain name system, or DNS, which is just simply a set of instructions that say, hey, this computer friendly 
term, 8.8.8.8, is really just Google, which is a human-friendly term, this ability to translate. We also needed to invent ways to route all this packetized data between networks, because as we increase the number of nodes in ARPANET, the different organizations that are, that are connected to one another, we need to have more efficient ways in which we route that data. So we come up with the term routers. And you remember, in an early video, we talked about this need for a black box. Well, that's what the routers end up being uh, created for, to serve as this black box to route information. So in the 1970s, up and through the early 1980s, key technologies and instructions are written. Scaling the technology enables communities of interest to develop. As more and more people find the beneficial uses of this inter-networking technology and computer technology, new communities of interest form. But they are built around very specific purposes. For example, at the Department of Energy and at NASA, they created their own networks to facilitate research and collaboration around very, very specific topics, whether it was space exploration or the use of nuclear technology. And by the early 1980s, even the military is utilizing this technology more widely. As these new communities of interest develop, ownership of this inter-networking technology begins to emerge. One of the key decisions made early on was that there needed to be public availability of all the documents specifying these instructions. Because if this is to grow organically, if we are to see this technology more widely accepted, then people need to understand what the instructions are so they can build their applications and their tools to conform with those standard instructions. This leads to an acceleration of growth in the adoption of new technologies. New companies are formed built around developing technology that implement those common instructions. But those instructions are developed within a public community. Remember, the internet or internetworking is not owned by a single organization or government. It is owned by all of us, the entire planet. So it creates this feedback loop of leading to additional growth and adoption. And because it's open source, it allows people to, in a very public way, to create the best possible instructions in a way that's very open and collaborative. And today, there are dozens, well over 75 working groups that are working on instructions for the next generation the next generation of technology, things like autonomous cars, things like smart devices. Those instructions about how those technologies are developed are being actively debated in these global communities. So in the 1970s through the 1980s, we move from an ARPANET that is, consists of just a handful of nodes in the West Coast of the United States to by 1981 in this graphic, you can see that it now spans, or we have nodes that span across the entire United States. So, what did we take away from today? The private sector helped drive the growth of the internet through the development of scaling technologies. Things like Ethernet at the Xerox Corporation. But we also see during this time, community development that allows us to accelerate standard adoption. And so by the early 1980s, multiple purpose-driven networks are now connected together. This is really the foundation of what we know now as the internet. In our next video, we're gonna talk about how this foundation of the internet goes from being something that's sponsored by DARPA into something that is privatized that has transitioned to be wholly owned by the private sector. I hope to see you next time.
Hi, welcome back to Cybersecurity for Everyone. I'm Dr. Charles Harry. In our last episode, we talked a lot about how internet technology had been developed in the lab and had started to bring in members of the private sector to develop other parts of internet technology. In this episode, I want to talk a lot more about how that is further privatized and how it's scaled. How do we actually start building a more global utility? So the fundamental question here is, how do we manage this thing, this thing that we've built, this idea, this great idea that started in the late 50s and early 60s and starts to develop a little bit and become a little bit more mature in the 70s? How do we actually manage this thing? And so by the early 1980s, internetworking has really become more popular. But most of the networks that are developed are very specific. They're built for a particular purpose. NASA, Department of Energy, are two examples of very specific networks that are developed utilizing this technology from the 1960s and 1970s. And so a variety of different protocols, remember, protocols are just simply instructions, are utilized to communicate, but they create a challenge for broader adoption, because if everyone's using different sets of instructions, it's hard to actually create a standard, right? It's hard to broadly communicate with one another. And so at the heart of all these purpose-driven networks, the way that they actually can communicate with one another is still this, this ARPANET system that was developed by DARPA starting the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s. So ARPANET is really at the heart of all these connections of these purpose-driven networks, which creates a problem. So if we look back at the origins of ARPANET in 1969, you'll notice in this map, there's just a handful of the nodes that we, that we originally discussed in a previous episode. That starts to develop further as time goes on. In 1970, we now see connections back to the East Coast. And in, by 1973, it expands even further. By 1982, we can see the development of several different networks on both coasts and in, also in the heartland of the United States. And so by the early 1980s, we see, in essence, the emergence of a broader set of networks. But ARPANET is still at the center. It's still the connective tissue between these independent networks, which poses a problem. Because remember, uh, when we first talked about the origins of the internet, the broader vision was that there was no single authority. We want to create a set of independent networks that have the ability to work together. And so if ARPANET remains at the heart of the internet, then we don't actually achieve that broader vision. So the goal is to allow networks to independently communicate with one another. And so we look back to some initial work that was done in the late 60s and into the early 1970s, specifically the invention of Internet Protocol and Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. And it becomes universally adopted in 1984. Now at this time, you have to remember, there were lots of different protocols that were in use. By adopting a universal protocol, we actually see the birth of the modern internet. So this is a key period in the history of the internet. So after the adoption of TCP IP as the universal standard, the government wants to get out of the middle of this internet. ARPANET at the time had been the central connective tissue. It's pulling itself out. And it wants to incentivize the private sector uh, to build out additional infrastructure. So while the National Science Foundation builds out a large-scale, cross-country, high-speed set of network connections, it prohibits the private sector from utilizing those particular connections. And the reason they do that is to incentivize the private sector to build out its own infrastructure. And by doing so, the government is further pulling itself out as being the central, uh, the central node in the internet. It encourages private sectors to now actually go out and get customers for these networks that they're building. So again, additional incentives by the government to make this a lot larger than simply a research project. 
And this leads to the first large-scale sets of uh, investments in the build-out of internet infrastructure. And this is really the first internet boom. Oftentimes, when we think about the internet boom, we think of the late 1990s and the World Wide Web, things like Pets.com. But this is really the first internet boom, where we start seeing broad-based private investment in large-scale infrastructure. And so that NSFNet, that set of high-speed interconnections, really crisscrosses the United States and broadly connects uh, research centers all across the country. But the government doesn't want to get completely out of the picture. They still want to support research in this area. And in 1986, the Supercomputer Network Study Act of 1986 was introduced by Senator Al Gore. And this is oftentimes you hear these jokes about Al Gore inventing the internet. And what, they're, what he's oftentimes talking about is his support and introduction of legislation that increased investment in internet-based technologies. That act allocated $600 million for high-performance computing and specifically looked to accelerate the development of high-speed networking. It also provided funding for a couple of different research centers, one of which, the National Center for Supercomputer Applications at the University of Illinois, led to the development of what later became the core technology behind the Mosaic web browser. Now, we'll talk more about Mosaic in another episode, but I want to highlight the fact that the government, while not being at the center of the internet anymore, by pulling itself out of running ARPANET and having ARPANET to connect all these various uh, uh, networks is not totally out of the picture. It's just redefined its role. So what are the takeaways? Well, first and foremost, the birth of the modern internet takes place in 1984 with the adoption of TCP IP protocol. Because remember, there were all these different competing protocols out. In addition, these broad-based incentives for the private sector to build out its own networks and for it to develop its own customer base was a way for the government to more broadly have internet technology be accepted. And finally, the government wanted to support additional research specifically in the area of high-speed networking as a way to more readily uh, make services on the internet available and useful for a variety of different customers. In our next episode, we're going to talk about the next internet boom, specifically the development of the World Wide Web and how that began to transform how we actually utilize the internet. Hope to see you next time. Hi, welcome back to Cybersecurity for Everyone. I'm Dr. Charles Harry. In our last episode, we talked about how to scale the internet and how the government tried to use incentive structures to get the private sector more involved in building out the technology. In this episode, I want to talk about the next internet-based boom, building the World Wide Web. And this is oftentimes the way that most of us interact with the internet. So, by the late 1980s, the internet really had become uh, standardized. We had standardized the specific set of instructions that were required for internetworking, right? This concept that was initially pioneered in the late 50s and 60s. And this is a reflection of the collective work between academia, the government, and the private sector. And so by 1992, the internet really is a global standard linking millions of devices around the world. But it's not quite the way that we think of the internet today. It was a set of networks connected, but the way in which individuals leveraged those networks was really quite different than what we find today. So the question is, how do ordinary people use the internet? It's one thing if you're a researcher and you want to share information with a colleague on the other side of the country or on the other side of the world. You can use a particular protocol to transfer a file. And that's helpful. It's useful. But that's really not quite the same way that we think about the internet today. 
We're not sharing cat videos. We're not uh, booking uh, hotel reservations, right? That's not what we're talking about by the end of 19, in the 1980s. And so the internet, you can think of it as a closed system of private networks. And there are some firms that exist that try to develop some sort of user interface, a way for people to actually leverage this utility. And so a gentleman by the name of uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who's working out at CERN in Switzerland, comes up with this concept of the World Wide Web in the late 1980s. And really it's a sense of web pages of content that are linked together and the ability for people to modify that content, which is at the heart of this idea. So Berners-Lee, out at CERN, develops the World Wide Web and it quickly becomes adopted by early users because of the ease in which they can develop content and link it together. So on top of all these networks that are interconnected, you now have a set of instructions that allow users to develop their own content and to create linkages with other content on other networks. So there's an information layer that's put on top of all these network devices. And so one of the very first popular applications that's developed to navigate the World Wide Web is something called Mosaic. And it becomes quickly the most popular web browser very early on. And by 1993, the World Wide Web becomes the dominant way to utilize the internet. Tim Berners-Lee helps develop and further uh, uh, move this particular set of technology forward by helping to form the World Wide Consortium in 1994, which is basically a way for them to manage content. We'll talk more about governance of the World Wide Web in another episode. And at this particular point in time, Silicon Valley Investment really starts driving additional web technology development. And so what we start to see is that there's a move from most of this work being developed in, the, in, in Western Europe and on the East Coast of the United States and, and starts to get moved over to the West Coast. So in the early 1990s, Mosaic is the early leader in browser technology. And starting in 1993-1994, the core development team of Mosaic picks up and goes out and forms its own corporation called Netscape. Some of you may have heard this company. It uh, does not exist uh, anymore. At the same time, the Microsoft Corporation comes up with a competitor browser platform called Internet Explorer. Many of you have probably heard of this particular browser. And so what you see in the 1990s is intense competition between Netscape and Microsoft. And they quickly dominate the entire market of browser, for browser technology. So the World Wide Web continues to develop throughout the 1990s. And what started off in, in essence in a laboratory environment in 1990, out at CERN, by the end of the decade has over 350 million people utilizing the World Wide Web. Imagine that. Something that is just dreamed up in 1990, 10 years later, starts to dominate globally. It's the user-friendly ability of the World Wide Web to develop content and to link it together that makes it the first killer app. So the takeaways from this particular episode are first and foremost, the standardization, privatization, and scaling of the internet that we saw and we talked about in the prior episode really sets us up for a new set of technologies, the World Wide Web. And it sparks a new round of competition between a couple of corporations, specifically Netscape and Microsoft. And by the end of the decade, we now see the World Wide Web as the dominant way in which users leverage the internet. In our next episode, we're gonna talk about how the World Wide Web is continuing to develop. See you next time. Hi, welcome back to Cybersecurity for Everyone. I'm Dr. Charles Harry. In our last episode, we talked about the origins of the World Wide Web 
and the development of the early browser technologies. In this episode, I want to talk about how that technology has been further developed over the last 20 years and why that matters for cybersecurity. The commercialization of the World Wide Web in the 1990s uh, led to, eventually, the first tech bubble burst in 2000. But there's a growing user base of the World Wide Web. And certainly, new technologies are driving the growth of that user base in the early aughts. We see the development and introduction of home Wi-Fi routers. We see monetization of advertisements by Google. And so the monetization of search becomes incredibly an important driver of the development of a user base for the internet. And so something called Web 2.0 starts to emerge. In the early 1990s and through most of that decade, web content was static. We're very used to now being able to book a car online or a hotel or buy an airplane ticket to fly anywhere around the world. We're used to being able to pay all of our bills online. But in the early days of the World Wide Web, most of the information was static, meaning you couldn't interact with the content. It was really, really useful if you wanted to get information about a particular product or service, but if you actually wanted to do something, it wasn't very helpful. And so what we see is by 2004, more interactive content starts to emerge. Blogs and wikis and some of the early social networking sites start to come online. So a lot more interaction with users, a lot more content actually being built online. And so Web 2.0 really marks this acceleration of daily usage by consumers. Instead of the World Wide Web simply being a, a bunch of billboards or advertisements, it is now becoming much more ingrained in day-to-day -day use by consumers, by ordinary people. And so growth in user interactions by companies such as MySpace, Amazon, Facebook, Friendster. Many of you probably have never heard of Friendster, but it was one of these early social networking sites. This greater demand drives really two important trends, cloud and mobile computing. So let's talk about the first trend, cloud computing. In the early days of computing, computers were really big and expensive. They filled entire rooms. The people really couldn't afford them. But as technology became more affordable and the technology of miniaturization and miniaturization of computing technology takes hold, those computers become much more portable and they're much more usable by folks at home. So businesses and consumers start buying their own computers instead of leasing or renting computing time. And yet, while most people have access to computers in their homes and in their businesses, the really big and expensive computers still remain out of reach. And so, while those systems have been around, the movement back to shared resources, the ability for consumers or businesses to gain access to those really powerful machines, starts to make a comeback in the early aughts or in the mid-aughts under the name the cloud. And really all we're talking about, and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about cloud technology in another episode, what I want to highlight here is that there are some really expensive machines that have really you know, significant capabilities where people want to be able to leverage that for some particular purpose. And we've now renamed that concept the cloud. Amazon in 2006 develops a suite of tools that allows users to access these really powerful systems. And now we see a whole suite of other companies that are engaged in similar cloud technologies. Amazon Web Services, or what we call AWS, Azure, which is a Microsoft product, Google Cloud, etc., are all examples of cloud systems that basically are allowing users to gain access to these really powerful systems and not have to buy it themselves. That's all it is. But there's also a second trend. Mobile computing. And mobile web technology has its origins in the late 1990s. And frankly, even maybe a little bit earlier than that. But mobile networks in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, are just not fast enough 
to be able to quickly download or upload data on the World Wide Web. That begins to change. And so by the end of the aughts, faster third generation, or what we call 3G technology, allows for greater speeds. And by the end of the decade, in July 2007, Apple introduces the iPhone, an absolute revolution in mobile computing. And so by this last decade, we are creating a network society. And we're seeing growing connectivity, you know, home Wi-Fi systems that allow for you to connect your Roomba with your uh, uh, smart light bulbs, as well as your laptops and your mobile devices. We're seeing a broader set of social connections and expression, social networks like Facebook, blogs, wikis, and other communities that people are interacting with on a regular basis. And then, of course, we're seeing supporting utilities and sensors. We're seeing the ubiquitous adoption of cloud computing. We're seeing the development of what are called the Internet of Things, all these devices in your home and in businesses that are connected to the Internet. And so by the end of the 2010s, modern society is leveraging the Internet as a global commons. In this decade, where are we going? We're seeing the increasingly use of advanced analytics, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. We're seeing the introduction of autonomous vehicles and smart road infrastructure. And of course, we're seeing the rise of smart cities and networked critical infrastructure. It's becoming much more prevalent. And who knows what this decade is going to give us in addition. So all this together is painting the picture of the internet becoming not simply as a tool, not simply as a utility, but actually part of modern society. It's part of the fabric of our institutions and our society writ large. So why are we even talking about this? This is a cybersecurity course. Why are we talking about the history? Because the history is important if you want to understand vulnerabilities. Because remember, the internet was conceived, built, scaled, and commercialized by academics, the government, and the private sector. And a lot of that technology is kind of old, 40 to 50 years old, in fact. A lot of the basic foundational concepts of the internet were developed in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And so some of that technology that was developed 40 or 50 years ago includes vulnerabilities that still stay with us today. And when you couple those vulnerabilities with complexities in the interconnections of billions of devices and billions of people around the world, it creates the recipe for potentially very large-scale public concerns. So what can we take away from this episode? First, what we start to see in the early aughts is the movement away from purely static content that we see in the 1990s to something that's much more interactive. We also see the drive of cloud and mobile technology in that decade. And in the last decade, we've seen the adoption of internet technology as not only simply a tool or a utility, but really at the core of modern society. In our next episode, we're going to explore how data actually moves from one point of the earth to another. And this becomes fundamentally important when we want to understand hacking and how those vulnerabilities in these various protocols can be exploited. I hope to see you next time.